The Retirement Cafe Podcast, Episode 39, A Guide to Funeral Planning. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe Podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. He is your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is brought to you by the Retirement Planners MFP Wealth Management. Today I am sat opposite a gentleman who joined me live on the panel at the Retirement Cafe uh, last year where we discussed funerals and probate. Yet we get to all the exciting topics that you all want to know about. Simon Head runs an independent funeral directors in Bournemouth called Head and Weeble. Um, welcome to the podcast, Simon. Thank you, Justin. It's nice to be with you this morning. So, um, Simon, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Certainly. I'm Simon Philip Robert Head. The boys in our family always have three names. The girls only ever have two. I don't know why. But then we haven't had a girl in our family for five generations, so we're a little bit boy-heavy, I suppose. Uh, My grandfather, George Head, began in 1926 in Bournemouth. The family had been here for three generations before that. So um, Grandad looked after the business, and then he passed it on to my father, Philip, who joined it after his service in World War II in the Navy. He came back. And, uh, and then it's my turn to look after it now. And we now have two of our sons. We have two sons, both in their mid-20s, uh, James and Robert, who are with us full time. Wow. My wife, Catherine, works in the business. We've been at the Lansdowne premises since 1926. We're a small family business with traditional values. But uh, these days you have to have a bit of a modern twist if that's what your customer is after. Right. Tell me a bit more about the modern twist then. Well, it, <laughs> I suppose in the old days, it used to be always um, somebody died more or less at home or in hospital, and the service would be a service in church followed by a burial, almost always. And then cremation started coming in in the 30s and 40s. More overly, after the Second World War, cremation was a more accepted form of... um, Sadly, it's called disposing of a body, because we are people in our lifetime, but the way we recognise each other, of course, is in our physical form. Mm. When the spirit clearly goes you're left with what we recognise as the shell, and that needs to be disposed of. Okay. Slightly different way, yes, I can see that look. You weren't expecting that, were you? No. So, um, one of the things I'm, I'm not sure I would know, what if someone, you know, I was just mentioning before, a, a pal of mine's um, mum has just died. You know, um, he's kind of out of the area, he's got to travel back home, he's got to sort that out, so she's, she was on her own. Where does he start? Well, one would assume he'd been contacted by the person who was responsible for letting the family member know. The first question you need to ask yourself is where actually has the person died? Does the body actually need to be moved? So if, for example, um, the lady has died in hospital, then there's no pressure immediately on him to make uh, further arrangements. Um, The paperwork needs to be sorted out and the hospital administrators will do that. If she's died in the community then the body will need to be moved to a funeral director's or if the doctor is unable to um, ascertain straight away what she's died from, then the coroner will be informed and the body will be moved to the public mortuary. And again, that's pressure off in terms of him having to make instant decisions which are going to affect what he's going to do in the next two or three weeks. Right. And so does the doctor make those, help him with those kind of decisions or...? or Certainly you can't do anything until you've got a medical certificate of cause of death, which is issued by the attending doctor in the last period of time. If a a, a doctor has seen the person within 14 days of their passing and they know what they've died of, then they can issue a full medical certificate and then you register the death and then you can make funeral arrangements. Ah, There are other complications which I'm not going to bore you with because they are endless at this stage. Right, okay. What point do they call you? At all various stages, um, sometimes in blind panic, and the first time, the first thing you always say to him is just, just take a breath. Okay, everything's going to be fine. It may take a little time just to sort out, but we can help you through with what stage you are at. We can ask the various questions which you might not think of, um, and just work through things with you carefully and slowly, so that eventually you and, in this case, mum can have the funeral arrangements that you've possibly thought about. Yes, and that's the thing. Uh, at what point do you start thinking about your funeral arrangements? 
Well, the more modern thinking is sooner rather than later, but you don't have to. It doesn't suit everybody. Right. There's, there's no one size fits all with this. We're all individuals in life as we are in death. Uh, some people can cope with life situations better than others. Mm. Um, and you know, we often get people phone us saying, well, I need to do this, I really need to do this now. Okay, well then let's make an appointment, let's come in, and often I'll sit as I am with you and I'll chat with somebody for 20 minutes, half an hour, won't write anything down, and just try and get a feel for where they are in their preparations for you know, actually formalising their arrangements. Yeah, yeah, and so... Do do people need to make the decision of whether they want to be buried or cremated or, or what have you? B- b- yes, prior they do. To, prior to them dying? Or, or, or yes, they do. Okay. Um, I mean, the law has changed now, but some time ago, you actually had to put it in your will that you wished to be cremated. Yes. Otherwise, you were automatically buried. Ah. That is now not the case, um, but it is sensible because the paperwork is quite different um, to arrange a burial. The paperwork is much uh, less than it is with a cremation. Um, and you can't actually move somebody uh, from a hospital, for example, until they know whether it's burial or cremation. So that is something that is uh, you need to think about. Ah, yes. And, of course, you know, the big question that I wouldn't have a clue about is what, what does it cost? I mean, that, you might say, well, it all depends on, you know, if you want six white horses or, <laughs> or, or I don't know, um, uh, it used to be called a pauper's grave type of thing, but uh, you know, wh- how, what does it range from? Well, it would range probably anywhere from about two thousand pounds upwards. Right. I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, you can spend silly money on silly things. Right. But then that's in the eye of the beholder. It's a bit but like love, you know. It's in the sure. eye of the beholder. Um, but it doesn't have to cost crazy money. But it depends on what your aspirations are. Often depends on your relationship with the person that's died. Is there a little bit of guilt in there somewhere? Mm. Um, do you, are you going to make practical decisions or are you going to make emotional decisions? Um, planning something is important, but it oughtn't really to be in the forefront of your mind all the time. So if you do get a thought, write it down, put it in a piece of pa- on a piece of paper somewhere separately, and then revisit that if you get another thought. My wife Catherine's up to about three days of music at the moment. With oh, that's nice. I ought to have that at my funeral. Well, I mean, we've got three days of music, so she's going to have to you know, own that at some point. <laughs> you presumably you give them family. It's a slight exaggeration. You might get family rates. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. It depends how she behaves. <laughs> and of course, if she's still the current Mrs. Head when she passes. Well, of course. Don't read anything into that, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so we talk about unusual requests. What? What? Could you give me an example of some? What, well, what, what is unusual? Not, not normal, I suppose. Yes. Well, what is unusual to you might not be unusual to me or to the people that come to us. Um, sure. Family backgrounds are important, and what is important to them it depends on their upbringing, of course. I suppose odd. Well, where do I start? Really, you can get some very colourful um, characters that want to do things that are slightly off the wall. Now, as long as it's not illegal then it's doable. Right. And most things aren't illegal. I mean, you've got to be pretty daft to try and do something illegal. It's, it's rather difficult in a, in a normal sort of situation, really. You can have any type of music. You can virtually have any type of coffin these days. I mean, for example, you can have a, a cardboard coffin and it can be decked in all sorts of colours, flags or um, anything you want. Visions of, um, of different animals or people. Um, I think we had one with uh, Napoleon on it at some point on a, on a charging white horse. And that's right. pretty unusual, but it's doable because it's all imagery. The majority of people that come to us want something fairly straightforward, which yes. means it's um, a coffin, which is a flat lid, it's plain sides, it's all fitted properly inside and out. But you can also spend a lot of money on caskets. Burial, you have a lot more um, in, in terms of size and shape and costings, and actually what it's made of. With a cremation, the funeral director actually has to make a legal declaration to the crematorium authority that he's not presenting something to them that they can't burn effectively. So there are smoke emissions issues with that. Um, So your limitation um, is slightly more with cremation than it is with burial. Mm. And Mm. if the coffin's too big, you can't get it in the cremator, and you have to bury it. And if it's too big to go in one grave, you have to buy two, which is rather expensive. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, gosh. There's a lot to uh, <laughs> there's a lot to think about. I, I got asked the other day, um, and I'm not massively familiar with them, I must admit. Uh, but I did get asked the other day whether uh, this lady had, um, you know, she, she'd came to a retirement cafe live event, and she said, 
she'd got you know a r- reasonable level of assets and seemed to be all great etc and asked me about a couple of housekeeping issues around her money and then she also said she said um do you think um do you think i should get a uh, you know a, an insurance plan um this one was from the co-op. I'm, I'm sure there are other, other ones are available. Um, is that a good idea? And I must admit, I, I, I said to her, I said, you know, be honest, I have no idea. I think from what you've just told me, you have significant assets and you won't have much, your state will not have much problem paying for it. Um, we understand that you can present the bill to the bank and, and they should be able to settle that for you. Is that your understanding? Yes, it is. I had a spell before I came into the family business. I did three years with Barclays Bank, which was a great experience uh, for me in terms of how a bank account worked, etc. But yes, if you have a funeral account, it can be presented to the bank who would be quite pleased to pay it. Certainly if it was perhaps even slightly more than what was in the account, it was a, an easier way in those days for the bank to close the account on behalf of the estate. Um, but the funeral expenses can be paid out of liquid funds. It doesn't have to wait for for probate. No. But obviously if funds are um, in something less tangible, then it, we have to wait for probate um, or the family or the in- individual yes. uh, would pay for it out of other funds. And have you found um, the insurance, I suppose you, 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 you're, not in the, you're not in the business of purchasing the insurance, I suppose you may be in the position of um, dealing with the, the insurance companies if, if the event of, of, of someone presenting an insurance plan to you. Yes, I mean, there are two ways with this. Um, you've got a life insurance policy which pays on death, mm. um, and you ha- and then that sum of money is paid into the estate. Um, that can be used for all sorts of things. Now, going on slightly as a tangent from that, with a prepayment funeral plan, yeah. basically it is an insurance policy, but it's with a funeral tag on. And that has implications as to who actually is the plan provider, but who is the provider of the funeral service. And the two sometimes marry up. Right. In many cases, they don't because the insurance policy is a national policy. And again, like I said in, uh, earlier on, it's no one size fits all. We're all individuals. But because it's a national policy, it has to have certain guidelines that on an individual basis, and funeral directing is really rather parochial. What we do in central Bournemouth is going to be different to perhaps how they might do it in the forest, right. et cetera, et cetera. If somebody is of a mind to do an insurance policy, it might be better to do it without any tag-ons that they might not like. Um, It's better to have your choice of funeral director, I would have thought, if you're going to actually give them instructions on how to proceed on their behalf when they're no longer here to tell you. Yeah, so uh, this this message of, of writing down what you want and having a conversation and giving guidance to who you're leaving behind is key here. It is really. It falls into two camps. You've either you've got the uh, pre-arrangement. I have quite a lot of people that phone me up and then we meet and then they give me their instructions, but they're not interested in the prepayment side of it because they don't want the restrictions of that. And also it means that if they move area, they haven't got the rigmarole of trying to change it. That is one of the benefits of a national policy, is that they have the same arrangements with whomever the funeral director might be. The difficulty with that is that the funeral director doesn't know who you are. And some people tell you something, and sometimes you know they don't actually mean that. They actually mean something not completely different, but slightly different. Yeah. And it's knowing the family background that can often help you in that situation. Sure, sure. Now, I've come across natural burial a few times recently. What's your thoughts around that? Well, a death is either natural or unnatural. (laughs) Yes. Um, These days, it seems to me that everything has labels. Well, I was never really brought up with labels. You are who you are, and you can be who you want to be. So labels can be a bit restricting. I don't have any particular um, difficulty with any of the labels, but it depends how somebody talks to you and what they want to do. Yeah. They say, well, I want a natural death. Well, that's actually not in your hands. Sure. Well, it might be. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> of course, absolutely. So, um, well, you know, that's been fascinating listening to you there talking, Simon. What are, the, what are the kind of key messages that you'd like our listeners to take away when, you know, th- when thinking about this subject, if they're listening over there? Morning cornflakes. Well, yes, or morning, co- yes, quite, morning cornflakes. <laughs> Haven't had those for a while. Um, well, I suppose the most important thing is actually nothing to do with the funeral, is actually if you haven't got a will, please do a will. It makes life very, very much easier and legal Um, when you're no longer here. Mm. Also, you may um, need to look at lasting powers of attorney. I know this is not my subject, but it actually is very important. 
Um, in terms of your funeral arrangements, if you like the sound of something, whether it's you've come across a reading or a poem or a piece of music that you like, write it down. Um, and this can be ongoing. Um, your list is probably going to be quite long. <laughs> Not everybody goes to church these days, so no. uh, we don't have um, so many hymns. Um, but you might have three or four hymns that you think, well, that might be rather nice. So write it down. If you want to formalise it in terms of a prepayment, be very careful who you do that with. Do your research. Right. Might be better to um, at least go and talk to a local funeral director rather than a group. Depends on your aspirations. Depends on how much money you want to set against it. But there isn't probably any one situation where a funeral prepayment will cover absolutely everything at the point of need. No. Well, the other thing that's important is that you know that the sum of money that you've paid for a prepayment is going into actually doing that service, not into administration costs. So again, be aware of how that might fit together and whether that fits what you want it to do for you. Yeah. Whatever the sums of money are, um, that's almost irrelevant. It's what is it going to do? Fantastic, fantastic. So wise words there from Simon. Well, I, I really appreciate the time for coming to chat to me today and this morning. Um, you know, you're always uh, very engaging when, when what can be quite a dry, delicate topic. So um, thank you for so much for coming and having a chat. I'd just like to leave you with one thought mm. that's just popped into my mind. There was a lovely lady whose husband was rather on the lazy side. And when he died, this is a long time ago, and this isn't a gag, this is actually true, and the lady's still still with us. Uh, she put her husband's ashes in an hourglass and she turns him three times a day because it's the most active he's been in years. <laughs> Anything goes. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, to find out more about Simon's business, uh, then head to the show notes at theretirementcafe.co.uk where you'll find the useful links to his contact details and his uh, web address. If you'd like to continue the conversation about topics we've discussed on the podcast, please search for the Retirement Cafe page on Facebook and follow our page. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, please, please leave a review on iTunes or share with your friends and family you may think who also may enjoy the podcast. That makes a real difference for us. Um, so this is brought to you by MFP Wealth Management. And so until next time, this is Justin King helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk. 